Well, Merry Christmas, Crossing Church. Hey, 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 hey. When I say Merry Christmas, you're supposed to not go, Whoa! You're supposed to go, Merry Christmas. So, I'm going to try this again, because like I'm, that's, you're freaking me out. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Merry Christmas, Crossing Church. Woo! That's awesome. I'm so glad that, yeah, that you guys are here, that I get to be here, that Clint gets to be here, that we get to have this opportunity to worship the Lord together in this Christmas season. Are you worn out yet? Is, it, is, it, is Christmas taking you over yet? Has that happened? I don't want to be Scrooge. Really, I don't want to be Scrooge. But Christmas is inconvenient. Come on. It is so inconvenient. Just look at your calendar and look at your checkbook and tell me, is it convenient? No, it's not convenient. There's very little about Christmas that is convenient. But is that why we do it? I mean, it's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It's emotional. There's like negative things that we think about during Christmas that we can't get back. We've talked about that. But we don't celebrate it because it's convenient. We celebrate it because it's Christmas for goodness sake, right? And when you, when you think about the first Christmas, and, and this is the time of the year when we think about that, uh, it really, really wasn't that convenient either, was it? I mean, think about the people, the major players that were involved in the Christmas story. And try to find me at least one thing. You could just like say one thing. I read this in the Bible, and during the time of the Christmas story in the Bible, this particular thing was convenient. There is not one thing in the Christmas story that was convenient. Think about Mary. She's 14. She's 15 years old, right? An angel comes to her and tells her, tells her that she's going to be pregnant because of the Holy Spirit and she's going to have the Son of God. Can you imagine her going and telling her parents that? Hey, not convenient. Not convenient. How, how about the parents? How about how they deal with that? Was that very convenient for them? They had a plan. She was betrothed to Joseph. And by the way, how about Joseph? Was that convenient for Joseph? No. I mean, he's got this whole idea of what his life's going to look like and, and how Mary plays into that and, and how it's going to be in Nazareth. And that was not convenient. How about a census to be taken that's ordered by the Roman government when Mary is nine months pregnant in the winter? I mean, don't you think that there's got to be some time in this story where, where one of these characters looks up to heaven and goes, would you give me a break? <laughs> because it's not convenient. They get to Bethlehem, a 90-mile journey that she's taking when she's nine months pregnant, the first time that, you know, that, that she's having a child, and there's no place to stay. Really? And then they get there and, and, you know, and they, have to, they have to have this child in a barn. No room. And while we're thinking of it, was this convenient for Jesus? For, for the Son of God who reigns on the throne of heaven to come down and be dressed in swaddling clothes and cry like a baby in a manger. Is that convenient for him? And so the question is, why would God choose circumstances that were so inconvenient? I mean, God could have done anything, absolutely anything. And he picks a story where absolutely at every turn, in every circumstance, in every situation, it's completely inconvenient. Maybe, just maybe, there are things in life that are more important than our own convenience. What do you think? I believe that. And while, while we're thinking about that, and that concept's going through your mind, let me ask you this. What about accepting Christ as convenient? I mean, we, we've seen, uh, as of this week, 937 people accept Christ in our church since January, and it hasn't really been convenient for any of them. I mean, it's not convenient to come forward. It's not convenient to humble yourself. It's not convenient to tell somebody else that you need Jesus, that you can't handle your own circumstances, your own situations, your own problems. It's that I really need a Savior. I need someone to save me because I can't save myself. It's not convenient to dress in uh, clothes for baptism and get wet in front of everybody. It's not convenient to get dunked in water. It's not convenient 
None of this is convenient. And while we're thinking about that, it's certainly not convenient to look at everything in your life and think that it's all got to be changed. Everything. My relationships, how I view my, my marriage, how I view my family, how I view my work situation, how I view my finances, how I view my time. Everything is going to change when I accept Christ. And what about that is convenient? So why do we do it? Exactly. Because it's worth it. It's worth it. And that's why I want you to hear from Clint. Really? Yeah, really. That's why I want you to hear from Clint. Because Clint and Megan, his wife, were believers, and they were worshiping in a great church in the, in the community of Pittsfield. And they had, their whole fam- they had their family involved, and they had strong relationships in that church. And Clint led worship. And he had a good job. He was a sheriff's deputy in that town. And so, you know, he had a good job. He made good money. He had great benefits. And he was able to bring his faith, his personal faith, uh, into the community because he was the DARE officer. And so, you know, he could be bold sharing his faith in the schools. And he had access to that because he was the DARE officer. Uh, and he could live his faith out like that in the community. Doesn't that sound good? It sounds like a, a very good life that he'd constructed. It was very convenient for him and for Megan. But you know what God did? What God always does. He put an inconvenient thought in their mind. And and this is what it was, that the lost in Pike County needed a place where they could find Jesus. A place where they could feel welcome. And they had not experienced that at that point. And this is two years, listen, this was two years before the crossing came to Pittsfield. And so they got together with some friends and they started praying. They started storming the gates of heaven with that inconvenient thought that maybe somebody, maybe them, Lord, we're available. Lord, whatever it is that you want to do in us or through us or have us sensitive to so that we can see that happen in this community. Because because God, this community so desperately needs to have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's so many that are missing out on it. And they prayed about that for a long time. And when the crossing came, they saw that as the answer to their prayers. And so the very first weekend, when we met at the, at the uh, retirement, uh, well, I don't know, I can't remember, the uh, Senior Citizen Center in, uh, in Pittsfield, they were there. They were there. And, you know, that wasn't convenient because that meant that, that they were leaving the church family that they had invested so much in, and that was hard. And there was pushback there, and that was hard. But they responded to God's call. And they were there together, and when there was a need for youth ministry, they volunteered their time. I mean, there was plenty of things they were doing already, but they volunteered their time to be involved in youth ministry, and they got more and more involved in what was going on. And then we had that time, we were going from part-time to full-time, And I have never been more clear from a spiritual perspective that that Clint Weir was the guy that God wanted leading that congregation in Pittsfield. And so you know what they did? They abandoned, yeah, they abandoned their convenient life. And all I need to say is this, look what God has done. He has done incredible things, and even though, even today, Pittsfield as a location, as a, as a building, is our most inconvenient campus, but that hasn't stopped God from doing incredible work, and I want you to welcome Clint Weir to the stage. Yeah. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to uh, be able to speak to you from the bottom of my heart. I want to bring you a word tonight, and I hope you're ready. We're going to jump right in. Uh, if you want to uh, turn in with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, we're going to do the uh, Christmas story. It's uh, your, your typical Christmas story. If you've ever seen Charlie Brown's Christmas, uh, when Linus, at the end, Linus rolls out on stage and he, he talks he quotes Luke chapter 2. And I'll just set it up this way. What happens is, is Jesus is already born, all right? And Joseph has already had like a conniption fit and, and the angel has come down and he's already calmed them all down. And then we're going to pick it up in chapter, in chapter 2 verse 8. 
So read with me here. It says this. And there were shepherds living out in fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. I want you to remember those two words, at night. Those are huge. Those are very important. We'll come back to those in just a second. So here's the deal. God did some inconvenient things, but he chose some unlikely people. You know, normally we would take this verse Eight, and we would read right over it because they're shepherds and they're watching the flocks. Okay, let's get to the good stuff. But I want to unpack this verse for just a second because I believe this is where we can relate. Shepherds and the occupation of a shepherd was a dirty job. It was a filthy job. As a matter of fact, shepherds, all they did was hang out with sheep. They did it 24-7, 365. They were dirty and they were smelly, and it was inconvenient for them, and they were kind of like outcasts from society. They didn't have a lot of influence. They weren't that big of a deal. Kind of relates to some of us, doesn't it? Because we're pretty dirty people. We have dirty lives, and some of you, you work some hard hours. You work, do some hard work, and sometimes it feels like it's for nothing. And so we're going to take this verse and we're going to walk side by side with the shepherds because I think there's something that we can learn from these guys because they're unlikely people and they're the ones that God made the big announcement through. It's going to be awesome. So let's read on here. Verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, it says this. It says, an angel of the Lord uh, appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Not some of the people, not most of the people, but all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He's not a homeboy. He's not a friend, not a counselor, not the man upstairs, a Savior, Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor Rests. Tonight we're going to talk about four reactions that the shepherds have. Four reactions that I think we can identify with. And the very first reaction that I believe we can identify with is the shepherds were terrified. Let me ask you this question. What are you scared of? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of snakes? Are you afraid of water? Are you afraid of heights? Hopefully none of you suffer from homophobia. Does anybody know what that is? That's the fear of sermons. <laughs> Nobody's left, so we're good there. And I'm going to be very transparent with you. I suffer from nitophobia. That's right, folks. I'm scared of the dark. I am terrified of the dark, especially when my wife's gone. I'm a mess. Drive by, you drive by my house, and my, trees lit, or my, and my house is lit up like a Christmas tree. I am scared to death of the dark. And you know what? We can relate to these guys because we know what it's like to be terrified. But my question is, why are they terrified? I mean, there's an angel that appears. All right, that's pretty cool. But then the Bible says this. The glory of the Lord shone around them. What's the glory of the Lord? Well, we know in the Old Testament when the Israelites were wanting to get out of captivity in Egypt, God used his glory to lead them out. And he used it with a thing called the pillar of, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And so literally during the day, these Israelites would look to the sky for the cloud and they could escape. And by night, they looked for this pillar of fire 
and they could escape. So what we learn is we learn the glory, glory of the Lord that was shown around them literally was a pillar of fire. Now, I just want to tell you folks, 2 o'clock, you're getting ready to check out from the day. A huge, huge hole opens in the ceiling of your employment and a glory cloud comes down and there's fire and there's a- angels and it's craziness and it's a madhouse. You're going to be scared. I know there's always that one out there. I ain't scared. You would be scared. But immediately, immediately we hear an angel, and the angel says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, because guess what? I bring you good news of great joy for all people. And here in Scripture, we see the first time that Jesus is shared with people. And he's shared with shepherds, which were unlikely. And they were, and they were dirty. And they were outcasts, kind of like you and me. These shepherds were scared. They were terrified. What happens when you share Jesus with people? What happens? They get terrified. I'll tell you the answer. They get terrified. Why would they get terrified? Here's why. Because when you share Jesus with someone, inside their heart, what they thought was right, and what they thought was accurate, and what they thought was normal, isn't so much when they give their lives to Jesus. And that terrifies people. You see, us as human beings, we are scared of the unknown. We're scared of not knowing what's going to happen. And when you share Jesus with somebody, the things that happen are unknown because we walk by faith. And that, if we're honest tonight, scares a lot of people. You see, these shepherds were terrified. And when you share Jesus with somebody, please don't be surprised if they push back. Because they're terrified. It scares them. It's change. And you know what else I believe tonight? I believe that deep down inside every human being, there's a place. When you share Jesus with somebody, they know, they know what it's going to be like if they die without a Savior. And that's a fire I want no one to know. These guys were terrified. The second reaction we see tonight is this. The shepherds were curious. Let's read on. Let's read on in verse 15 and 16. It says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go. Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord had told us about. You see, the first reaction of someone when you share Jesus is probably going to be, pushback they're going to get fearful they're going to become terrified because change they know change would happen and they might have to give up things but let me tell you this stick with it eventually they get curious eventually they start asking questions they begin wondering things like why are you so happy why do you have so much joy I wonder what it would be like if I started a small group. I wonder what it would be like if I began to serve. Why is that church growing so fast? Because they're curious. They want to know what's going on. They're curious. And that's why we're teaching through this series, Before and After, because every one of us in this room has asked those questions. Every single person in this room has asked those questions like, why am I here? What is my purpose? Is the Bible true? What does it mean to pray? How can I talk to God? Because we're all curious. We're all curious. But here we find in this story that the shepherds are curious They're curious people, and so curious that that's not where they stop. The shepherds, we learn, they take action. They take action. They move. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what the future holds, but you know what? They take 
action. Really, all they have is their faith. I mean, in the story, all they have is their faith in what an angel told them. And they step out of their comfort zone, and they climb over the fence, and they start the journey. Folks, let me tell you this. I'm going to be very blunt with you. There are people here tonight, and you're just taking up seats. And you're getting your check mark. And you come here every week, and you come for the show, and the lights, and the stage, and the performance. And you get your Sunday in. But I know deep down inside you're curious. And you're wondering. And you're wondering what it would be like to start the journey. You're wondering what it would be like to start this journey. You see, I can only imagine what the, what the, the, what the shepherds were thinking as they were walking down that road. As they were going towards their destination, when they began the journey, I can only imagine because it was their time and it was their moment. And they were probably saying, man, I can't wait. Eventually we're going to see the crowd. we got to be, I mean, there's got to be some sound. There's got to be some large yelling because this is the greatest thing that ever happened. But you know what happens when they get there? What they find? Mom and dad and a baby. No crowd, no lights, no stage, no fog, just mom, dad, and a baby. I know you sit here and you're curious and you wonder what it would be like if you would just step out. And start the journey because at the end of the road, all of this doesn't matter. At the end of the day, none of this matters. What matters is what the shepherds found. And that was Jesus. You know, earlier I said that all the shepherds had was their faith. And what the angel had told them. But the Bible speaks of something else they had. Let's read it. Verse 14 says this again. The angel says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. The shepherds had favor. They had the favor of God. And tonight, if you can hear the sound of my voice, you have the favor of God. What are you saying? I have the fa- you have the favor because God created this time tonight and he specifically drew you into this building because he wants to speak to you and he wants you to start your journey and he wants you to begin and step out of your comfort zone. You have the favor of God. Don't be satisfied with just being curious. The third reaction we learn from this story is the shepherds tell everybody. They tell everybody. Let's read it on in 17 and uh, uh, verse 17. It says, When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. You know, when we find out something exciting, We want to tell everybody. We want to Facebook it, and we want to tweet it, and we want to shout it out because it has impact on us. That's how the shepherds felt. Something had changed them. Tonight, listen to me. When you meet Jesus, something changes you. Your attitude changes. The way you see people change. Jesus will change you just like he changed the shepherds, and you'll begin to tell everybody about it. It's exciting news. You want to spread the word. Everywhere they went, they spread the word. They weren't geniuses at theology. As a matter of fact, they really didn't even know theology. They didn't even know what theology was about. But they told their story. They told the story of how they were frightened and how they were curious and how they began the journey. And then they got to it and it was Jesus and he changed their life. He gave them hope and he gave them peace and he gave them comfort and he gave them a purpose and he gave them hope and peace and comfort and a purpose. And that's worth telling. They told Everybody.
Remember, it was good news, great joy for all the people. It's good news, great joy for all the people. All of the shepherds and all of you. It's good news. It's worth sharing. And some of you here today, you don't have a story. You don't really know what to share. And that's why you're here tonight, so you can start a a story. For the rest of you, you need to share your story. Revelation 12, verse 11 says this. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. In other words, listen to me. In other words, we will overcome by what Jesus did and what Jesus does inside of us. And that is worth telling. The shepherds told everybody. The final reaction that we learn from the shepherds is this. They returned home. Same field, same sheep, same job, same times, same swing shift, same straight twelves. They returned to the fields. How did they return to the fields? Not the same person. Not the same person. They return to the fields a new person. They return to the fields with a new hope. They return to the job with a new joy and a new peace and a new direction of life because they had been changed by Jesus. Yeah, they return to their place. They return to their world. But they return to their world as agents of change. You see, that world out there, it's not going to change. It's not going to change. I can't promise you tonight that you're going to walk out of this place and your finances are going to be any different. I can't promise you that you're going to walk out of this place and your relationships are going to be any different. I can't promise you that you're going to walk out of this place tonight and your marriage is going to be any different. But I can promise you this. You can walk out of this place changed. A new person with a new hope and a new faith. Because Jesus never promised to save us from our circumstances, but he promised to walk with us beside him all the way. And he's promising you that tonight. You see, for us, the world doesn't change. We change. We're the change. We're the ones that need to change. We're the ones that need to walk out of this place and be the change. How did the shepherds walk back into their Fields. Well, they climbed back over the fence. And the Bible says that they were glorifying and praising God. (laughs) Did you hear that? They were glorifying and they were praising God. Oh, what it would be like if we were to have marriages that walked out of this building and begin to glorify and praise God in everything that they did. Oh, what it would be like if we had men that would walk out of this building tonight and they would begin to glorify and praise God in everything that they did. Oh, what it would be like if we were to have people in this place and every place watching that walked out of their church and begin to glorify and praise God in everything that they did. All the hope that would spew out of you and all of the peace that would illuminate off of you. All of the hope and the love and the joy and the peace that you could give to those around you because they need it. You, my friend, are the change. You are the ones that can change because you're the ones that were called to be change agents. You're unlikely. You might be dirty and messy and filthy, but you're the ones 
that need to be changed, that need to be the change. Remember at the very beginning, I told you to remember two words. What were they? At night. Let's read that verse again really quick. It said, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Here's where I want to, I want to end tonight. In the darkest hour of the darkest time, in the loneliest place that these shepherds were hanging out, probably feeling uh, excluded from the world. It's just another night, but they're lonely and they're dark and they're hurting. God broke through and his light was shown around them. And he led them from being frightened to being curious on the path where they found Jesus and their lives were completely changed forever. Let me ask you this. Are you going to return to that world out there the same person that you came in here as tonight? Are you going to be the same person that you were when you walked in here? Because you're the, you're the agents of change. You're the ones that need to be the agents of change. Don't walk out of this building the same way that you came. We're moving to a time of decision.